afternoon, everybody. Uh, I can't decide whether you're here because you're campaigners, passionate or propagandists, but it's good to see so many people here. Um, this session is called Campaigning Documentaries, The Fine Line Between Passion and Propaganda. Um, my name is Claire Fox and I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. Just before we start the session, I have to explain that this is obviously part of the Sheffield Festival, but it's also part of the Battle of Ideas session. The Battle of Ideas was a festival that was held last weekend, and this is known as a battle satellite. Um, and the idea of the Battle of Ideas is that we try and engage the public in intelligent debate about difficult issues. Uh, we have a slogan which is shaping the future through debate and free speech allowed. And at the Battle of Ideas Festival, we had 2,000 attendees, 350 speakers, 75 debates over a weekend discussing all aspects of politics, current affairs, and more than anything, trying to challenge a few orthodoxies. So we were delighted to be here, uh, to be invited to be part of Sheffield, which is not so much a public festival, but very much pertains to public debate because documentaries, uh, documentary films are certainly one of my passions and have obviously helped inform uh, public discussion over the years. So what is this particular session about? Uh, I'm going to start off by quoting Jess um, from a couple of years ago when she said, it is time for charities to step up and become commissioners themselves. They have a lot in common with filmmakers and it's a bit of a no-brainer to at least say, let's get together. Now, we all know that funding for documentary films is difficult at the moment and it does seem sensible that filmmakers would look to social change film finances and things like BritDocsGoodFilm.org um, and The Good Pitch and things that Jess has initiated but I think are becoming more popular. The idea of getting campaigning NGOs and foundations, Greenpeace, Amnesty International, Friends of the Earth, NSPCC and so on to actively fund documentaries seems to a certain extent harmless enough. This morning you might have gone and seen Petropolis, uh, a new film about petrol and oil um, and however, that film was produced by Greenpeace Canada. And you could say, great, a film is made that wouldn't be produced otherwise. But this discussion is about, I suppose, critically examining that and asking if there are any difficult questions. The kind of questions we might look at are about editorial independence. What happens when Greenpeace funds your film? Does it actually move over from being journalism into propaganda, however benign? And although we all know that those NGOs that I've just mentioned appear to be the good guys, um, and the audience will undoubtedly think if the NSPCC or Greenpeace are involved, this has to be a good thing. I think we might say, if you substituted Greenpeace for ExxonMobil or Shell, and they funded a film and then had a campaign around it, it might be more nerve-wracking. So are we suspending disbelief just because they're funded by the good NGOs? That's what I've asked the panel to debate. Great panel, I'll introduce them. First of all, Jess Search hardly needs uh, introducing. Chief Executive of Channel 4 Brit Dot Foundation, co-founder of Shooting People. She's published, well, I'm sure you've all read it, um, Get Your Documentary Funded and Distributed, a very popular book, especially amongst this audience. Um, and her foundation has given grants to enable feature docs such as The End of the Line, The Yes Men Fix the World, Afghan Star, Chosen, and Moving to Mars, uh, which uh, I previewed here the, um, uh, the other evening. And um, then we have Nick Fraser, who's been editor of Storyville since 1997. He says that the films shown on Storyville come from anywhere in the world and deal with any subject. Very open and brief. In 2007, he was series editor of Why Democracy, a series for the BBC, which I personally loved, uh, which was simultaneously broadcast in 42 countries and won countless awards, including the 2008 Peabody Award. And he admits a quote that I rather like, a persistent and undefeatable belief in the power of reason. Um, and uh, Nick has been critical of this kind of trend, but we don't know what he's going to say today, because it's always unpredictable. Um, but he's going to use his powers of reason to say something interesting, we hope. Um, next up will be Kevin Toulis, who's a director, writer and co-founder of Many River Films. He specialises in films about conflict and terrorism, and is an acknowledged expert on terrorism. Is the author of the classic account of the Irish Troubles, Rebel Hearts, Journeys Within the IRA's Soul. And his doc uh, credits include The Devil Amongst Us, uh, The Big Heist, The Cult of the Suicide Bomber. And he recently uh, directed a controversial panorama on the trauma industry, on the misuse of the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. And about anything else, apart from the fact that Kevin always 
never frightened to speak his mind. Kevin also comes from a journalistic tradition into documentaries, and I was quite keen to get that voice on the panel. And then finally, we have Kerry Dingle. Uh, Kerry's uh, uh, collaborated um, with the Institute of Ideas over the years, has produced and put on a number of uh, debates for us at the Battle of Ideas Festival. She's the director of World Right, an education charity that focuses on global equality and whose slogan is Ferraris for All, which will give you a kind of sense of what, where she's coming from. Um, World Right campaigns for change using film. I mean, she's a filmmaker, but mainly because she's a campaigner. And she uses film um, and her online news channel, World Rights, to, in a way, change the world. Kerry established the documentary film training facility for young volunteers and has helped volunteers produce 100 challenging programmes over the last year. Um, she directed five documentaries entitled, collectively, Pricking the Missionary Position, shot in Ghana, as well as Flush It and Corrupt a Babble. And uh, those films are not so much uh, films that you might have necessarily seen on TV, although I'm sure if there's any commissioners and you want to commission this, you won't mind, but they're actually used as campaigning tools and have been taken up by educational institutions globally. Um, can we give them a big uh, welcome, please? The form of this session is I've asked them all to speak for five minutes just to lay out their stall. Um, some of them, there might be a couple of clips shown in the midst of all that. We'll then have a sort of 15, 20 minute um, discussion stroke, row stroke, interesting exchange on the panel. But actually this is meant to be a public conversation and as much as possible try and get the audience in. When I do come to the audience, it's not going to be one of those things where I take one question and all the panel painfully answer. Um, I'll take uh, contributions, you know, five, six contributions from the floor, and then just have quick fire responses from the panel, anything they want to pick up. So, with no more ado, uh, thanks. Jess, can you kick us off, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. I mean, there's so much to say um, about this topic. I'm, I've got five minutes, right? I'm going to try and just cover a few of my major points. I've got more than I can say in five minutes. But, in short, we, you know, we're having a really exciting and positive experience with this area. Um, at the foundation. Um, I'm, I'm loving working with NGOs. They have so much that they, can, that they can teach us, that they know, they have expertise in the area, they really understand about impact and change. They give us access to, to new audiences. Avaz has got three million members, <coughs> Amnesty, five million members globally. They can use films, they can use our films in totally new ways. They give a longevity to the films. They take the film into house parties as a training tool, as a lobbying tool. Um, you know, their constituencies and friends of their constituencies. And more, more than that, I've actually found it quite, it's been, you know, it's been actually inspirational. Like, it can be quite jaded working in TV, and it can be jaded pitching to commissioning editors. And when we put the good pitch together and we brought around the table not just people who are lifelong uh, TV professionals, but campaigners and, and NGOs and, camp and foundations, it, it, you know, it's genuinely kind of uplifting to be in a room and to be working uh, on a film with people who <coughs> really are knowledgeable and care about the issue and who are kind of very often, I think, more positive and less jaded than TV people. And I've seen even commissioning editors um, at The Good Pitch sort of suddenly light up and reconnect with why they came into TV in the first place, you know, making films they wanted to connect important things to people. And also humbling, because I think, you know, Filmmakers can be arrogant. We can think we can just drop into a subject, um, spend kind of four months, you know, making the definitive kind of opinion piece uh, on a subject area. Whereas often there's an NGO who've you know got a 15-year experience, you know, on the ground, and actually it's humbling. I think um, when we're making the end of the line, working with the organisations who help fund the film. I mean, these people who you know who deeply understand the issues in the area, the politics of change, how you get consumers to change, and it's a fantastic learning curve working with them, which we would never have had if we um, got the film commissioned by broadcast. And I just wanted to say, you know, the, the, the good pitch we've done, we've done four this year. The last one we did was in New York with the United Nations, was opened by Mohammed Yunus. Eight fantastic projects, an incredible array of organizations in the room. And just this model, I think, you know, if you have a chance to come to a good pitch, I think really the model kind of is proving itself. Now, there's a lot of talk about the dangers of this, and you know, Nick has been very vocal um, back in March saying that um, NGOs were one of the big dangers um, facing documentary. And I, I just don't get this. I think this is a total false alarm. Um, it's a sort of uh, bogeyman. Um, we raised a massive budget to make a really big, ambitious, and powerful film, which um, you know, was mutually advantageous for everyone involved. Uh, none of those partners sought or got editorial control. 
Um, Ara Erasing David um, was co-funded, uh, our organisation, the Joseph uh, Roundtree Reform Trust, I think some people here maybe um, saw that when it premiered last night. Um, they, had, they took no editorial uh, input into the film. It was agreed up front what the general aims of the film were and how that would work for them and work for the organisations they fund. And now we're working with them to make sure that film can be used by all the privacy organisations they work with to give it a really rich and long life um, and, and do more than be shown on television, but to really kind of change, um, change people's opinions and policy. So I just don't, I just sort of don't um, particularly kind of get what the, what the, what the, you know, the insurmountable uh, problem or danger is here. And I think there's a, there's a kind of myth um, that perhaps Nick's comments are uh, sort of are, are based on, which is some idea that the current model is, uh, is in some way superior. I mean, I don't recognize a world in which TV commissioning editors are solely control, uh, con concerned with truth and art and want to give filmmakers their independence to go off and tell stories as they see them. I don't know, do you recognize that world? Um, you know, every money has color. Uh, money that you get from a TV broadcaster comes with a color. Money that you get from an NGO comes with a color. And I think filmmakers are really adept at understanding uh, that, that money, you know, comes with things and you kind of work around that. Um, and TV commissioning editors have agendas that they try and push on filmmakers. They're concerned with ratings and impact. They're not necessarily concerned with, you know, we've all been, uh, probably had personal experience of being forced to push films in certain directions. So I think it's really, it's the commissioning editors who are the only people in this equation who stand to lose. Um, I think it's, you know, the world is changing. We know very dramatically the way content is being funded is, and distributed is changing. And the, the old gatekeepers, these, the, the commissioning editor role where you basically, you had say about whether things were made, you know, or not made. And actually, you know, end of the line was passed on by the TV companies. You know, that film would not have been made if those NGOs hadn't stepped in kind of to make that. And that's a big adjustment for broadcasters that actually they're not necessarily the decision makers anymore about whether content is made um, or not made. And, you know, I think the fourth estate is desperately unaccountable. The old gatekeepers are unrepresentative. Um, you know, they get to choose what's important and, and what line happens. And, what, and why should they any more than NGOs? Yes, NGOs have got uh, agendas. Um, they want to see things change. They've got politics. Um, for sure they have, but so did commissioning editors. Um, and actually, commissioning editors, I think, are far less accountable, un uh, far less accountable than people who end up running large uh, and interesting NGO organizations. Um, and more than that, they're going to end up being slightly irrelevant because, you know, when you can get together these kinds of partners, I mean, the co-op has got 3 million members, Avaz have got 3 million members, Huffington Post, 8 million users. We distributed a film called uh, Steal This Film, we, uh, a film that um, we gave a grant to. It's been downloaded 4 million times um, from pirate sites. It's never been shown on television. You know, we're now able to work with different campaigning organizations and get reach and impact for our films, which doesn't necessarily mean that we even need television in the mix at all, although it's all, always wonderful when they come along because they bring something special to the mix, but they're no longer the decision maker about whether these things happen. So in short, the old model of kind of broadcaster will decide whether it gets made and what the angle is and broadcast their truth, and this new model, which is a, a humbler, a more coalition and partnership model of saying, let's come together in coalitions of people who feel likewise, each bringing different resources to the table. The filmmaker brings the film, the campaigning organization bring their resources, their expertise, uh, and their connections. And let's learn and share together. This is a new world, and you know, people are having good experiences. Of course, there are bad experiences. What's really important is that we learn and share what's going on with each time that we make films with NGOs, so that actually best practice can emerge and we can move forward um, together, I think, into a really, really exciting future. Okay, thank you, Jess. Very class, clear statements of, of, of what's good about this. Nick, your thoughts? Um, well, I, I think I'm here under misapprehension because I actually have nothing at all against campaign documentaries, nor do I have any problem with documentaries being funded by NGOs. I, I think I'd like to draw your attention to the, the omnipresence of the notion of the campaign in contemporary life. I mean, it, it can mean everybody has campaigns, you know, Ad agencies have them. Um, Saul Bellow says in one of his novels that so, someone has, they don't have ideas, they have buttons instead. Well, it's, it has really proliferated and it is to some degree really devalued the notion of a campaign. You can say that a, a campaign exists, therefore, a campaign is wonderful. But face it, not all campaigns are so fantastic. Um, before I came here, I went through my, my um, in-tray at Storyville, and I did actually come, come up with three um, documentaries presented to me as campaign documentaries, and I thought you'd like to hear about them, because they're interesting. One is called 
Druidophobia. And it's basically about the rights of indigenous British people. And, um, you know, as always with these things, there was a long list of um, supporters. But I noticed the presenter was called Bio Dicker, and she did appear to be a cousin. I think it was of Nigel Farage. So that's a kind of, that's a kind of model. Another thing is, another thing that came to me was a, a very, very lengthy um, series called Stalin war nicht so schlecht that came from um, a PO box in Switzerland, right? With a, it was a, a committee for the defense of Russian democracy that founded it. And, you know, one of the, one of the, the, the again, a great number of things attached to them, including Putin films. Now, I'm not really kidding about these things. We actually received numerous campaigns um, submitted to us that, that are not actually um, coming from very desirable people and that don't result in films that are either truthful or actually, you know, particularly illuminating. And I think you, you have to understand that when you get in the world, which I don't reject at all, I think that what um, Jess is talking about, I accept all of it. I accept that um, commissioning is, is out of date. I'll be the first person to reject that and I'll hurry up and get another job the day that comes through. <laughs> I accept that money comes from all sources these days. I just want to caution you and say that some money is better than other money. Secondly, I, I really would like to tell you that there is such a thing as independent journalism. Of course, it is not fostered adequately and coherently by broadcasters. It is not even fostered adequately and coherently in, in the bulk of the dying press. Though there are some publications, shall we say notably The Guardian, that do better than other publications, notably the Financial Times too. I think it will be a huge mistake to say that independent journalism, whether it's in documentaries or um, it's print journalism, doesn't matter and we should just dump it. We should just in t instead take the rather illuminating advertorials that we see in papers and shortly we will see on our screens. Now, just to repeat, I have absolutely nothing against these advertorials. Were the BBC's rules a trifle different and had the fishing film be offered to me, I would definitely have taken it. Um, the BBC, for its own reasons, um, has decided that it has to have a very firm policy on independent journalism, on impartiality, but I'm not here to defend the BBC's position. I would like to point out to you that much of this debate is fueled not just by the growth of NGOs or the truly terrible state of the world, um, and why not campaign? Why not campaign against the death of the ocean? Or the, or the death of the planet, indeed. You know, why not try to do something about it? But it's also fueled, I think, by the truly dire state of the finances of documentaries, for which broadcasters are mainly to blame. The broadcasters do not fund documentaries adequately, do not look at them, do not look after them adequately, and that is, I think, a major act of cultural vandalism of our times. I think, actually, in my own place, the BBC has been somewhat better than other documentaries other people are looking after documentaries, but let's say the record is not glorious. But I, I want to suggest to you that if Dr. Goebbels were to appear and he had a huge sack of money, there would be documentary filmmakers just round the corner queuing up to take his money. It's a fact of life. So if the money comes from foundations of any kind at all, uh, you have to realize in part why that's happening. It may be happening for Jess's idealistic reasons, but it's happening for other reasons too. Now, I would, I, I'd just like to have three short things to say that I'd like to show you a clip. Quickly. Um, it seems to me that, um, you know, collaborating with NGOs, um, it all depends on what your relationship is and what, what the NGO is like. That's an obvious thing to say. The second thing I'd like to say is that, uh, as my colleague and rival Tabitha Jackson said, you ought to be able to look at these films as you look at any other documentary. There's no segregated campaigning documentary. There are good documentaries and bad documentaries. And the whole thing is relevant. The, fun the funding is relevant for NGOs because it brings more money into good documentaries. If it doesn't, well, it's less interesting. The third thing I have to say is that you, you don't have to change the world by campaigning. There are many, many other ways. And I think we've done quite a lot of Storyville in this context that you can actually change people's attitudes in quite different ways. And in this context, I'd just like to play you a short clip. It comes from Sergio. Now, I imagine that most of you have had to sit through butter-clenchingly boring 
programs about the UN, often funded by the UN itself, that actually make you feel, by the time you get halfway through them, as do many campaigning or propagandistic documentaries, liberal or not, they make you just feel ill with boredom. But there's a different way of making these films. And if we could just run the clip of Sergio, I think I can show you. Sergio was a man that had lived all over the world, but he was a Brazilian. It's a place where he was the son, he was the man from Rio de Janeiro. He was anonymous. He could become himself. Sergio had a well-worked tradition. Every time he would land in Rio de Janeiro, we would rush to Gilda's house, to his mother's house, drop the luggage, dash to the beach, to his favorite corner, run straight into the water, and the moment that he would go and put his head under the water and emerge up, he would say, yes, I have arrived. So, what do you wish me to say? No, you're going to speak to the people. Really? We're going to have 35 new staff members. I see. Where Gary is now, so... I see. Some spontaneous uh, wisdom. Uh -huh. Just how you, how you came to be High Commissioner. Oh my God, but you realize it? I can't summarize 34 years in three minutes. That's a huge... Thanks, Nick. And, and now, Kevin, your take on all this. Okay. A, a magazine writer on The Guardian for 10 years and used to do big sort of 5,000 word pieces. And, and the thing which I find slightly problematic about what we've talked about and what Jess has been saying is that you, you have to... I don't, don't just want to change attitudes. It's that you want to change understanding of how complex the world is. And that's where journalism, the, the craft of journalism, comes in. Two of the things that I'm probably most proud of uh, are doing in The Guardian is one, doing the only pro whaling article that you will ever see in The Guardian's archives, and two, a sustained attack on the aid industry in Africa. Now, I didn't do that just because I'm merely a perverse person. It's because the complexity of those debates are not something that you can just do it if we all agree, you know, we all agree that it's terrible to kill whales. But if you begin to disentangle the industry, you see that NGOs like Greenpeace are as mendacious and as self-centered and as unaccountable an organization as probably the CIA, in the sense in which they have a space and an agenda. And if organizations like that do support a film, do put money in it, they're doing it basically for their own selfish fundraising <laughs> reasons. If you look, bizarrely, if you look at the, the whaling industry, the Norwegian whaling industry is tiny. It's $30 million. Greenpeace generate hundreds of millions of dollars a year by campaigning against whaling. It's only through a kind of critical analysis, rather than just sort of agreeing all the time that things like the, you know, the environment, etc., that you can begin to see how the world is constructed. And it's easy, I think, to do things like films like The End of the Line because we all sort of agree with what appears to be an intrinsic good. We agree, all those things seem you know, like aid to Africa. Once you begin to look at that, you can see actually how organizations like Oxfam and Save the Children, who do do good work, but they can also do bad work. They can also make a bad situation worse. And I, one of the, again, the critical articles that I did was on the Sudan famine. The Sudan famine is an absolute tragedy, which was, which was exacerbated by the roles of NGOs. It wasn't saved by them. So 
where does that kind of understanding, where is, instead of someone saying, well, this whole thing about the climate change and stuff, where's the critical voices? Who would fund a critical voicing? It's a lot more complicated. You could go to Greenpeace, you could go to Friends of the Earth, say we want to do a campaigning documentary about how terrible climate change is, but who is actually going to say, well, there's another side to the debate? And if it was an oil company, why, why would that be wrong? Why would it be any, why is that any more wrong than actually Greenpeace or these big organizations, which, because they're NGOs, we, we tend to actually view them in a less critical light. So who in this debate about campaigning documentary, where are the genuine critical voices, which must come from a, a, a tradition, some intellectual tradition, which looks at the question on both sides. I know that, that obviously everyone, the color of the money is true. You know, you, I've made films for Channel 4. There is obviously a consensus about where, what's appropriate in a film and what's right and what are the critical editorial judgment standards. But NGOs don't have any editorial judgment standards. They are, they are sectarian organizations that are geared towards a political role. That's perfectly legitimate in a documentary, but it has very little to do with clear, critical thinking and critical understanding. Who is to check? I mean, if you were in Greenpeace and you said, well, you know what, the Norwegian whalers, they've got a bit of a case, haven't they? They're not absolutely terrible people. These are people who have civilized standards. They have a, most people don't know, the International Whaling Commission is based in England. It's based in Cambridge. It has found scientifically that you can hunt whales, but that's not a voice that A, you could ever ra raise in Greenpeace. It's not a voice you can now actually raise in the British national media because it seems so appalling because basically organizations like NGOs have been so successful in this area. So the thing I would say is it's good to have as many documentaries as possible, but what we want is documentaries that change our thoughts rather than merely reinforce our attitudes about climate change, about all of these things which are sort of remote, which we can agree on and don't really have a cost. And that's the difference, I think, between the, that very old-fashioned investigative journalism, which is revealing something about the world, rather than merely confirming our prejudices about the world. Okay. Right, Kerry, your thoughts. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Claire, for inviting me here. I feel like I should sort of doff cap although I'm not from a tradition that doff caps, to all of you great filmmakers, because um, for me, film and program making is a medium. And what matters is the message. And I come from a background in Sheffield, actually, an art school, and stood as a commie dyke, and I think I got 200 votes 30 years ago or something, and arrested by the leader of the then Socialist Republic of South Yorkshire. So I haven't never been afraid of being unpopular, um, but it does concern me today. You see, I think film is a very powerful medium, very exciting. You can do all sorts of fantastic things with it. Um, but it is, to me, just that, I'm afraid, a medium. And, you know, I'd use it as I'd use whatever to get a different message across and uh, not worry about it too much. But I do worry, what, very much as Kevin has said, um, when we talk about campaigning films and propaganda... Um, I do worry that it is NGOs that are being seen as the um, potential partners or funders in this. And first of all, it's worth thinking about what do we mean by propaganda? You know, what is propaganda? Propaganda, to me, used to mean the propagation of many ideas to the few, as opposed to agitation, the single idea to the many. Today, what propaganda tends to mean is not that let's take people beyond what they spontaneously know and think or beyond their immediate experience uh, to challenge prevailing views. Propaganda today is really a dirty, you know, it's, it's shutting down debate. It's saying that's one-sided, that's not the whole truth, um, that's not, you know, that's really negative, that's biased, um, and all the rest of it. And it's a word that's flung at things that you don't agree with. So, for example, we know that a film like Plain Stupid has been completely fated. Uh, and, you know, Franny Armstrong's got lots of skills, but I think it's a terrible film. Um, and I'd use all those words to knock it myself, whereas something like The Great uh, Global Warming Swindle is seen as propaganda, evil, or the rest of it, because it's taking the wrong side politically. 
And I'm not talking about propaganda as in the sort of World War II Ministry of Information propaganda films, uh, Capra and all that. Or, though having said that, I think the Cove is pretty Capra-esque, uh, as Kevin mentions, with its Japan bashing, you know, very much so, in fact, uh, along those lines. Um, but I'm talking about the way that propaganda is hurled now as a term of abuse, really to shut down debate. So if you question... Um, what's advocated in terms of behavioural change to deal with climate change suggests that perhaps that's a waste of our time. You're the equivalent of a Holocaust denier by questioning that. You know, if you suggest, as, as we have in our campaigning films, that that approach might leave our peers who have nothing in the developing world staying with nothing, then you, you know, you're a terrible sinner for saying this thing, this sort of thing. So I think a different tradition of propaganda, one which is about... Uh, taking us beyond what we know um, is one that we could do with resurrecting and there's lots of good things we could do with film to do that. And to explain what I mean by that, um, having gone to many music festivals and things over the years, I was at, I can't remember if it was Reading or Glastonbury one year, um, uh, surrounded by people who were in sort of rhino costumes to save the rhino and doing all sorts of things. And right next to a, a, a tent we had for debate uh, with youngsters was a campaign to stop the sexual abuse of disabled children. And they had lots of buckets, and you could get the poster, the badge, the T-shirt, the online petition, the offline petition, the whole banana. And a couple of youngsters came up to me and said, you know, will you sign our petition to stop the sexual abuse of disabled children? And I said, no. And they looked so gone out. And they said, what do you mean, no? I said, do you know anyone who supports the abuse, uh, sexual abuse of disabled children? I, I said, do you know, have you ever come across anyone? Can you imagine it? And given that, you know, 99.999% of the population would oppose the sexual abuse of disabled children, what are you trying to change? And that is the problem with what's called campaigning documentaries today. Where is the message that critically and politically engages with the status quo and challenge it, challenges it? That's the tragedy. Look, look at Afghanistan. This year, what films have actually questioned the West's right to be there at all? Next to none. One, you know, I think Tom Roberts' film, um, which does show the other side, which shows the terrible civilian ca casualties uh, as a result of Western bombing, ends with Human Rights Watch saying, see, the tragedy of civilian casualties in Afghanistan is that it's not making the we important Western mission look good. So where's the questioning of the West's right to be there uh, and, and question um, Afghanistan uh, sovereignty or rights of those people. I've got one minute, so I've got to, got to go. Just very quickly, similarly, Black Gold. Sorry, one of your you know, great films, just beautifully made film. And I wouldn't question the artistry in some of these great documentaries. Black Gold on fair trade. Who's critically questioning fair trade? Who decided that we can change the world with our shopping trolleys? What a ridiculous notion. Who's questioning whether Africa wants to be treated like a farm, as the colonialists and missionaries have always done? Where's the critical engagement? We've got Borders TV now, on all week. Where's the open Borders TV? That would be a good thing to push, and that's what I'm trying to push with youngsters that I work with. But to have the final say on NGOs, I want to show you one proselytizing clip that Nick will hate, but I love it because they inspired me. Uh, this is two young people, not young people, uh, two angry Ghanaians uh, on the role of NGOs from our Pricking the Missionary Position series. <laughs> No more bad by child abuse, trafficking, uh, teenage pregnancy. Sani Manina na ano still a koso. Enti no ke nyawo bi a be ba be boa ya ya sit ne mu a. Anu mu no be boa ya chen o mo mo be yesa is program. So there has been uh, many NGOs uh, which come here to do activities on AIDS, such as um, uh, the HIV AIDS education, family no, planning, family planning. Uh, uh, somebody will see some way, I think this thing will help them, push it for them, I'll let them do it. Because somebody wants some money to help his people, even though what is coming in is not really going to benefit the people who accept it. But it's about time we, we wake up, you see, it's about time we really wake up and we stand on our feet, try to develop our own things, try to market our own things, try to uh, I mean, live in, 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 in liberty. So that's what I believe.
Great. I'm going to come to you all now. I'm going to come to you all. There's so much bad temper on this panel. We haven't bloody started the debate. Right. I'm glad that everyone's so riled. Okay, over to Nick. No, we're fine. The weird thing is that Nick and I have just formed a pact. Exactly, fine. Do you know what? I am so not surprised. We're on the same side we're now. Totally yeah. Yeah. Yes. I knew that was going to happen, which is why I've got you both sitting over there versus there. There's one thing I disagree with Jess about. Can I yes. just say, you're misinterpreting me. The website, Why Democracy, was packed full of stuff like this. I mean, I think this is great. I think the whole point of broadcasting the web is to put voices like that up. Um, I've got two observations there. What Jess says about commissioning editors is, is pretty much, by and large, true. I'm, I'm a very lucky person because, actually, the B what remains of the BBC's lordly mantle has passed under my shoulders. I am really just obliged to um, commission things that are truthful and, if possible, beautiful as well, though that's not always possible, and who cares anyway. But you have to spare, you have to pity commissioning editors a bit because they, they, they work in an industrialized world of media. And Jess is quite right about their deficiencies, but they do do a slightly better job than she lets on. Now, about about propaganda, I think this is really difficult. I think that, you know, the pluralism of the media means that you have to, you have to accept all types of propaganda, including the most vicious, incompetent rubbish, and it's just a fact of life. But it doesn't mean somehow that everything becomes propaganda. You can make films, you can do journalism from a profoundly non-propagandistic attitude, and you can still change people's minds. Uh, and I think, I think what we should actually be considering towards the end of this session, as we should indeed at this festival, is actually how to stop broadcasters and newspapers getting out of independent journalism investigation. Because times are so fucking bad that instead of squabbling over, you know, the definitions of campaigning journalism, actually not very interesting as a topic, we should be devising some means to stop Channel 4 and BBC and other places selling the past and actually destroying what in this country is a pretty remarkable tradition? Um, Nick, interesting or not interesting is... I'm not, I'm not trying to curtail your enthusiasm, but stop clapping, because it slows it down. Um, in, despite what you just said about it not being an interesting topic, and well, this is... No, no, I, I'm... I'm just I, saying I don't find No, no, no. What I'm, look, the point being that there is a new kid on the block, which is a new type of funding, which is yeah. being pushed, right? And you have to at least interrogate that, whether you think it's interesting or yeah, not. Yeah, I, I say, look... And therefore, and therefore, you can't just sort of say, well, you I'll know, I want to talk about something else. Can, can yes. can so, Jess... Why, can I just say from quick. why I've joined up with Jess? Because the interrogation at the BBC is pretty extensive. I mean, these guys have been trained by Barrier or MI6. The interrogation over new funds got up my nose. That's why I joined Jess. And I think you have, I agree, you have to look at any sources, any sources at all for making good films, but you must be careful where you end up, obviously. Okay, Jess. Um, I want to say that, I feel like it's, I think the other two are characterising it as if I'm saying that all filmmakers should be in a general pact with all NGOs, that we should sort of like somehow sign some kind of, um, some kind of treaty which means that we'll only make films with them and we'll never criticise them. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, this is not a suitable model for all films at all. This is a suitable model for a certain number a certain kind of film. And, um, and what I liked about the end of the line is that we end up in a coalition um, you know, with Prince Charles, uh, Google, uh, you know, Greenpeace, and, and a in a film that also praises Walmart. Well, you know, I'm not going to be in a coalition with those people <laughs> or anything else. And if I make a film about architecture, I'm certainly not going to be agreeing with Prince Charles. And if we're talking about all kinds of other practices, I'm not going to be agreeing with Walmart either. But on this one particular issue about the need to get corporate change in fish pods, we could all come together and say there is a mutual advantage, a mutual point to coming together here. That doesn't mean that I can't then criticise those people about anything else. And of course we should be making films that point out bad practice about NGOs. Uh, of course we should. And loads of films have been made, um, obviously, pointing out um, you know, the complexities of aid in Africa. Africa. And NGOs themselves don't even agree you know, with each other. You'll, you'll find a range of opinion within NGOs. So it's entirely possible to uh, ally with some NGOs who want to push a certain type <laughs> of um, policy on aid, um, you know, again, you know, uh, in a film that's critical of other NGOs. So I just think it's, it's about one film at a time you know, and making partnerships which make sense for that film. And I just don't recognise this idea that somehow I've now you know, signed my life away to never criticise an NGO. Well, it, 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 
just in, in relation to the broader point, though, because you made you made the point in the beginning that um, uh, you know you don't recognise the past of a kind of truth art independence model. But that was an ideal, and it's a question of whether you think that ideal is compromised by this new funding. I mean, that's sort of it. I mean, it might be I that you're right. I'm saying the world is always messy and imperfect, yeah. and actually filmmakers know that and have been quite lithe to how but, they but, sort of balance those things. But and, Kevin and made and this, is also, this is also messy journalism. and imperfect. Yeah, but Kevin made some interesting points about journalism, because I thought it was also interesting that you said you felt quite jaded with the kind of cynicism in TV, which is entirely understandable. But it's almost as though the kind of campaigning documentary, the kind of, you know, worthier than now on the right side cause documentary where you've got a campaign, you know, it's like a sort of therapy class for jaded documentary makers. I mean, you make it sound like, well, we now feel we've got a mission, we can change the world. I mean, I'm all for that. I'm a political activist. It's just that I don't pretend I'm a documentary maker at the same time. I mean, if you want to be a political activist, go and change the world. But is there a danger of you getting muddled? No, I think, I think you know, the reason that filmmakers make films is they want those films to have an impact on the individuals that, that watch them. And actually, the model of television, which is, you know, you spend you know, in the case of independent feature docs, two years of your life, three years of your life making a film and it gets shown on telly a couple of times and hopefully loads of people see it and kind of that's that. Um, when actually, you know, when you work with um, a rich coalition of, of NGOs and, and campaigning organisations, you know, you're actually able to see your film, you know, impacting on people. I mean, not as narrowly necessarily even as campaigning, you know, in an educational way. Do those films just disappear into meaninglessness? I mean, I, I, I really liked your film on on paedophilia when you made it, but um, and the devil amongst us, was, <laughs> we, we actually showed it at a festival. I think that's how we met first. Fantastic film, but probably hasn't been seen by enough people. Yeah. Um, can you see the appeal of this kind of? Style? You know, I, I agree with what Jess is saying. Is that commissioning editors that, that the structure that we currently have, or the old-fashioned stru structure of you know being a BBC employee and uh, going to management and having lots of these commissioning meetings. But that's not ideal. I mean, that, that's not the, the recipe for absolute brilliance because obviously lots of television is really terrible. Um, but the point is it does still come from some kind of overview that you have to be fair to the other side, that it, 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 it should, should be a critical <coughs> engagement. Now, yeah, it's terribly sad that, you know, films have a very short... They, they say, you know, TV is the longest act of foreplay. You spend your whole life doing it and then it goes out and boom, and it yeah, disappears. It I mean, look. That, yeah, but actually, that's out of date now. No, but he's uh, yeah, but that's what I'm asking him. Yeah. Is this a way of modernising that model? Well, there are a number of other ways. Any film that appears on Storyville will be shown around the world, and it will have a life of one, two, three, four years, depending on what the producer does with it. All Jess is saying is that this activity of spreading the film around is a, is abetted a lot by private organisations, and again, nothing wrong with that. They supply the money. You do the outreach. It's exactly but then isn't. It be. But then that's the thing about it is, I suppose that is the concern, isn't it? Like, end of the line, Jess. You know, it's become. I mean, you can't pick up a newspaper now without somebody saying, "I've decided to boycott this restaurant" or yeah. "I've changed this." I mean, you know, you could say that's really effective, but there is something kind of like. Uh, and you said it's, it's created a broad coalition. I mean, you know, it's become very right on to say, oh, yes, I'm not going to eat anything but sustainable fish, or I'm going to not, you know, and I'm, it's a kind of consumer yeah, lobby you can, thing. You can view Jeremy Clarkson, who tells you to eat shit the whole time and drive rubbishy cars. Yeah, but I, I thought we were talking about... <laughs> no, we... we Funded yeah, by the BBC, yeah, indeed. Yeah, but, that, <laughs> no, but that's exactly the point, is, is that that gets the laugh. The audience all know what we're talking about. Jeremy Clarkson's the bad guy, and we all know that, you know, end of the line is the good film. We all feel better about ourselves. Does it help us have a more complex understanding yeah. of the world we live in? I think the danger, the, is, I'm the, the danger is that we end up like have the American... Have you seen end of the line? Hold on. The danger is no, that I we end up seen. with... I'm sure there's lots of films that I, I've, I've seen films. that you haven't seen. The danger is we end up with a very a, a, a partisan American model where you, you, you basically appeal to your own constituency all the time. No, I just wonder if you'd seen the film, because you seem to be criticising it. I no, I, what it. I thought was interesting was that everybody who's told me that they boycotted the fish uh, restaurants haven't seen it either. It's become a campaign <laughs> beyond the film. Right, yeah, I just haven't... I, I actually have heard from my friends who disagree with it that it's a brilliant you film, cannot, but I'm talking about the campaign. You can enough knowledge about the state of the oceans from one film. It's fine. It will propel you to find out more about the same subject, which you can go on the internet buy books, read more documentaries. These campaigning documentaries are not complete statements about anything, nor should they be seen that way. And by the way, it's actually not true about America. America is full of deeply pluralistic documentary filmmakers. Uh, they're, 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 the only problem about American documentary making at the moment is there isn't enough money, 
and that has meant that it's upper middle class lefties from Harvard who tend to make documentaries. It's people with giant trust funds. I mean, you know, that's a serious problem, but that's that's a much greater problem, in my view, than the prevalence of campaigns. Sure, but Nick, the, the point I was making, if you look at the, in a sense, the intellectual division in America, that you can you can get Bill Riley to do how the liberals are selling, you know, Hollywood, or you can the other the other version is how George Bush has sold us down the river, etc. You have a kind of shrill back and forth. You don't actually have a kind of examination. No, it's of, simply, of, I'm sorry, it's simply not true about the output of WGBH, for instance. You know, the, I was offered this morning an a hour and a half documentary about the Mille Lai Massacre in 1968, and it's, it's a scrupulous piece of history. America is capable both of supplying these sort of balanced, in the round documentaries and generating fantastic polemics. Or you have both at the same time, like a film like Why We Fight, that I thought was admirably balanced and polemical. You know, it came from a certain point of view, it had all the opponents interviewed, some of them were very pissed off with the film. And it, it did supply you with a sort of rounded notion of American militarism, in my view. And so I don't want to be pedantic, yeah, but go just, on. Just, um, just for the record, I mean, End of the Line doesn't interview any activists or campaigners. It's only scientists, no, um, no. and including, uh, including the leading scientist who um, disagrees with the uh, other scientists and their estimates of the, of the scale of the problem. So we de definitely include the other side of it. And it's um, based on a book by, um, you know, a journalist. So I just wanted to kind of... Um, no, I mean, it's based on Charles Clover's book, I know. And um, the point I was making was different, was because one of the models that you've got, um, which you advocate, and which I'm not sure about, that's what I'm saying as a political campaigner, is the idea that the film has got to be more than a film, it's got to be a campaign. And that's one of the things that's come with this um, thing. For me, documentary is given out there, you watch it, the audience makes decisions about what to do, whereas this is an active attempt at creating a campaign. So I was making the point that all sorts of people who hadn't seen the film had become campaigners. Yeah, based we're very on the pleased fact with that, yeah. Yeah, and I'm suggesting that that's a campaigning model and not necessarily got anything to do yes, with documentary. That was what I was saying. Can I chip in on this? Yes, Kerry. Can I chip in on this? Um, <clears throat> as an outsider looking in, I just I think Kevin's point we're missing here, which is very important, which is how um, undemocratic and unaccountable NGOs are. And I think one of the problems we've got these days is that people look to what's known as civil society as NGOs as somehow a greater good and somehow better because of our disbelief in politics and because of the collapse of politics. And I think that's very, very problematic in the sense that the worst politicians, you know, even the most corrupt, dodgy ones, are probably preferable in terms of our capacity to campaign and get rid of them than NGOs who see themselves as beyond that. Right, and NGOs do, do, do get absolutely... Um, I mean, first of all, it's quite hilarious that, that people see them as a great source of money. Obviously, there are NGOs that are very big business, and I've worked with and in a lot of them, and it's serious. There is some serious money floating about, which I think you know, raises a lot of questions, given what they claim they're doing um, for our peers globally. And when, in fact, most aid, even if you look at it, doesn't even leave these shores. It's much more about us. But I think we aren't questioning the collapse of politics. And documentary filmmakers aren't somehow immune from that. And regardless of who you go to for your money, I think you do need to think about your message. And that's the problem we've got here that I think is raised by the end of the line because, you know, it's all there. And, it, you know, Jess says, oh, yes, but there's scientists in the film. Well, yes, there are. Uh, and it's well made and all the rest of it. But we live in profoundly misanthropic times where there are, are going to be, I would say, ever more films about the planet, fish, whales, dolphins, and all the rest of it. And we are both demeaning humanity and our capacity to control and change things. And by looking to NGOs for money, we're contributing to the idea of politics not being important. And I think that's the big problem. OK, N Nick, come back, and then we'll go out right, to you. I, it's a very short comeback. I think it's ridiculous to say that NGOs are unaccountable. They're actually accountable if you could give them money. If they start behaving confidently A lot of it's from the government, Nick. Well, they're, they're separate from the government. They're, no, they're, they're not. You've just, said that, you've just said the politicians were more accountable, though. Yeah. I'm just well, saying, okay. if you look at, they're not even not very non-governmental. I don't, non I don't have an ample um, record dealing with NGOs in my life, but I spent the whole day in Amnesty International. I wouldn't go and work for Amnesty International for anything in the world. It's too depressing. It's too serious. It's it's like a daily torment confronting the evils of the world. But these people are not unaccountable. 
and they're not dishonest. They actually do a very good job. And I think you'll find a great number of NGOs are staffed by similarly idealistic, underpaid, good people. They're not that dissimilar from journalists, people who work in NGOs. They're sort of cousins, you know. It's the same sort of thing they do. And, you know, my area is mostly things like Human Rights Watch, another great NGO. These things have performed really, really fantastic things in the world. You wouldn't dream of trashing them and saying they're unaccountable. It's just, as an assertion, it doesn't work. Well, I, I, I think that that might just indicate why there's a debate here. Because for somebody to say NGOs are full of idealistic people and all the rest of it, um, that you've just said, and that there's no argument about it, let me tell you there is. There's at least an argument, and the fact that we're not having no, that I didn't argument. I say there was no argument about no, it. No, no, but of course some NGOs it would be ludicrous. Deeply corrupt shit. But but it's, not not just, it's not just corrupt. I'm asking the audience now, do you feel happy with NGO-backed advertorials as the way forward for no, documentary? No, no, no. You can't slip I'm being in provocative. There. I'm being well, provocative. They won't know which I way to vote, my, will they? I, Can you not have a vote? I don't know what the question is. I haven't is, done I my second question. Oh, for God's sake. No, that's a dumb question. It's a dumb question. Look, you know the bit about where you have to trust the audience to be able to work out a bit of sarcasm without treating them as though they're all idiots. They can listen I'm to me and work out. Idiots. Yes. I'm not them Let them listen to me as the chair and make their own mind up, Nick. And my second question was going to be, or do you want to go back to the ideas of objective gatekeepers who pretend that you have impartial <laughs> journalism, but really are taking one side and are very interested well, and just pretending to be question. objective? That was going to be my bloody second question. If Nick would shut up, audience, what do you think? Right, can I have... The chair is never remotely claimed to be neutral. Can I have um, the microphone people, please? Um, yeah, so that person sitting in the front, and I can see a hand there. I can't see the person. Oh, it's, yeah. So that lady there, and there's that gentleman there then. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, assumptions going on about what's good and what's bad. And we have to question whether there's been a big change from the liberal gatekeepers to the liberal big NGOs. I mean, there's millions and millions of NGOs in the world, and they're not all quote unquote good, and they're not all quote unquote shit. But it's really worth interrogating what's going on there because. Um, if you can say there's undesirable types who want to make these documentaries and at the same time insinuate that maybe people watching the good message will be able to go away afterwards and find out more information, but anyone watching the bad message would be completely indoctrinated and become a, a raring racist or something straight away because they wouldn't go. Um, I think it's really being assumptuous, uh, assumptive about the, about the audience and where the money's coming from. And, NGOs are, it's such a complex, big thing, you can't boil it down to one. And it's the same with experts and scientists. Like, what scientist, like, what, where's the anthropologist? Where's the, the, the farmer? Aren't they as much experts in certain fields as the scientist? So I think it can be a, get, a bit dangerous and a bit too <coughs> woolly liberal, actually. And um, we just distract ourselves from maybe the bigger fights and it should be about a cultural change rather than looking at a single event and saying, oh, it's the fish, when really, oh, it might be capitalism. Okay. So, um, Sorry, I was asked to ask um, by the organisers, can you say who you, your name and where you're from, that's all? Um, I'm Siobhan, an independent journalist from The Mule. That's okay. Um, and that gentleman over there, and then there's a guy there. Um, hi, I'm Tom Zees and I'm from uh, the Wellcome Trust, which is a very wealthy, unaccountable NGO. And, give, um, <laughs> just hold on, and, and, and sponsors the Battle of Ideas, which I organise. And sponsors isn't? the Battle of Ideas. Um, I've got a, a couple of points to make, really. Um, one uh, is whether or not we're getting too caught up in who's funding um, programmes um, and who's providing expertise in them. Because um, people can... You know, uh, a commissioner can retain editorial control of a program that's not funded <laughs> by the Wellcome Trust, um, but then there might be a whole bunch of our scientists in there. Um, they might be using Wellcome Trust archive material. We'll get a credit for that, but if we put money into a, a BBC program, uh, that, that's just totally outrageous. Um, uh, and then there's also um, the, the point of uh, NGOs that are 
um, not funding programs, but maybe are having programs made about them. Um, uh, Stepping Stones Nigeria uh, come to mind. There was a program, um, uh, Africa's Witch Children, uh, earlier on this year, which I thought was an amazing program. Um, raised a massive amount of money for them. If they'd had the money to put money into making it, I'm sure they would have loved to if they'd realised that it would make them so much money, get them so much um, publicity. <coughs> but they didn't. It was just a really interesting story. And so I, I'm not sure that the money is necessarily yeah. controlling the story. OK, Jess wants a quick uh, comeback. And there's that gentleman over there. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a really good one. When, when we invite people to come to the good pitch, both the NGOs and the filmmakers, we try and actually get the focus off this issue of funding. I mean, it is the kind of focus of this panel, but actually what NGOs have to offer filmmakers is very, very rich and very broad. And we have a checklist that we send out to NGOs before they come, <coughs> saying, please tick all the different ways that you might be able to help a film. And one of them is funding the film, and one of them is giving funding to the outreach. But there are like 30 other things on that piece of paper from, you know, um, how many people do you have on your email list? Would you communicate them? Do you have an annual conference? Would you show the film? You know, are you doing lobbying work? Could you use it? Could you use it as a training tool? Are you working in schools? You know, and actually, I agree, it's very, very, very rich um, what's involved in that partnership, and we often end up just talking about the money. But it's, it's much, it, what makes it so exciting working together is actually everything else, not just the money. <coughs> okay, that gentleman there, and then that lady there. Yeah, hi, uh, Richard York from Rainbow Collective. Uh, I don't know if, like, the two guys down on the other end are uh, kind of missing a big part of the point behind what. what uh, Jess and the guys Brit Doc are doing, but from making films and being at you know, film festivals all over the world and, and speaking to people <laughs> who watch documentaries, so often they just get, re they get really depressed. They watch the documentary and they're just like, oh, you know, that's really depressed. Now I don't feel like I can do anything about it. Isn't the world a, a terrible place? And what, what these guys are doing is, is getting it so at the end of the film, people actually have something they can do. It's just pointing them in the direction of saying, okay, if you give a shit about this issue, then here's a list of people you can look at, here's a campaign you can investigate, here's some sources you can look further. And you can say, well, fair enough, people should do that anyway. You know, Someone should watch something on TV and they should do that anyway, but they're not going to because they're barraged with so much other stuff that's coming on. What you do is you hook their attention, you get them interested, and you give them a jumping off point. Like none of the films that, that Brit Doc or Nick are making are, are, are really that preachy or anything else. They raise interesting topics and then they just say to people afterwards, <coughs> Jess films in particular, here's, here's something that you can do if you want to, here's how you can take it further. But you know, they're not really propagating ideas, they're just trying to give people opportunities to do something. Okay, so, and is that a model of documentary for the audience? That is a good thing, that's the question really. Yes, that lady there. Um, my point is mainly, I think the fundamental thing this comes down to is responsibility towards your audience. I think you can say people can make up their minds, but I think you have to be very clear where you are coming from and whether your journalism is is up front, you know, we should be saying in films who the money comes from, you know, we as audiences, we know this stuff, we think about this, but I don't think, you know, my mum and dad sitting there do think, I wonder who funded this. If you look at something like Taking Liberties, it was an incredibly biased film and people, you know, completely believed everything it was saying and I would love to know where the funding for that came from because that was Channel 4 putting out a very, very biased film and I think we have to think about an audience that doesn't challenge, they believe what they're shown because they think that the journalism is, you know, has the integrity. Ironically, that was very independently made. <laughs> yeah. It was tax break yeah. money and no NGOs were involved. Okay, uh, what, what, can you say who you are? Sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm from the Frontline Club. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that, that gentleman there. Hi, I'm Rajesh Lynn, I'm a filmmaker. I was in the, was in, last night I was talking to an American broadcaster and someone came up to them and went, so do you make films that do good? And she said, she looked at them and she went, no, we make films that do well and are good. And I kind of wonder whether that's not also part of this debate here, because it's easy to get lost in where the money's coming from, etc. But at the end of the day, if an NGO and filmmakers are getting together, what's going to work, and the only reason it's worth the NGO putting any money at all, is if that's a really good film. And I wonder whether we can talk about some of those elements as well. Um, I'm, 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 I really agree with you. I mean, although funding's at the bottom of this, it is meant to be the philosophical discussion that we're having, or what is documentary for. But I think the fact that somebody came up and said, you know, do you make docs that do good? And that previous contribution is, I think that's almost what shifted. Because, you know, when I've been coming to documentary film festivals, there's been a discussion about creating good quality documentaries that would make you think. But now it's, do you make documentaries that do good? And I'm just saying that is a shift that's in not tone. True. That's not true, though. Well, it's... it's, it's actually not true. You're saying you that go, there is... No, well... No, if you go to uh, festivals, you'll find, like the selection of films here, you'll find an awful lot of documentaries that 
are on the do well and are good, and you will find some that are campaigning documentaries. And that's exactly how it should be. There's no shift towards. Okay. Doc there's no. There's no, no shift at all. Not. No. That's why this room's full and people recognise something and what's happening. There must be some shift. That gentleman there. Well, there's shift is that more people are using money from NGOs. Yeah, Mike Lerner, I'm a, a filmmaker. It isn't really the problem that uh, state broadcasters in particular and independents, you know, the, the, this money which is ultimately backing these films is acting as a slight disincentive to broadcasters to fund films that should be made anyway. And that, that, that broadcasters get sort of a bit drunk on having this extra input and will just not make, make the films that perhaps they should be making anyway. That's my only point. Okay, that, that gentleman over there and then there's a lady there. Gentlemen, sorry, yeah, you, you, oh yeah, we'll go to the lady first if it's easier, if that, is, that, is that all right? Her first and then pass Hi. it over to you. So. Um, Melanie Salmon Both of you. from uh, Global Ocean Marine Conservationist. Um, I think maybe, I think that propaganda stuff comes in when there's money involved or it's um, in money stakes. So for example, Japan, Japan and Norway spreading fallacious science that whales are eating all the fish and should be therefore killed. And if some people want to present the other side because they think it's fair, that's up to them. But they should be clear it's purely for commercial interests. And I think the end of the line should really have been paid for by, the, say, the BBC because it's in the public interest for us to know that the governments have washed their hands on illegal fish. And then it's up to us uh, as consumers. We're the only people that now can save the ocean. So I think that's the difference is that, in fact, if it wasn't for NGOs, we'd have no whales to argue about at all. So that's up to Green Greenpeace actually save the whales from, from total extermination, etc. So that's what we're looking at is, what, you know, if NGOs should have a remit for public good and, and it's not for profit. And that's, that's what we're looking at, I'd imagine. Okay. Uh, that, there's two gentlemen over there, but that one first and then the person next to him. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, hi, David Berry. I'm a freelance producer-director. I've made films for NGOs and uh, a lot of films for the BBC. And the only difference for me, really, I'm very pleased NGOs are funding films. The only difference for me is I know when I make a film for an NGO, I just can't change my mind halfway through. I just can't. Whereas when you make films for the BBC, I can change my mind meeting people and deciding, actually, the film is about something different than I thought. I can go back to my commissioners at the BBC and they will say, yes, okay, if it's more interesting, make that film. But when I've tried that for NGOs, they get very, very upset, and quite rightly. And so in that sense, I think my BBC films are more truthful than the films I make for the NGOs. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to say, that one guy there, then get the whole panel if they want to say anything, and then I'll go out for another round. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree um, with the last speaker in many ways. Um, oh, firstly, my name's very hard to say. I, I live in South Africa and have done <coughs> for 20 years. Um, so um, we come from a, you know, our public broadcast is very new, very weak. And therefore, many documentary makers have to do those NGO films. And we call those in South Africa corporates um, because <coughs> it's a brief driven thing. You know, there's no, there's no real room often to invite participation of the audience and I think that's the problem and for us sitting outside of uh, certainly you know UK the BBC is a model is a very important international model which we hold up and wherever possible try and defend uh, but at the same time you know because there's less and less money as media is fragmenting um, year by year. There is, um, you know, I, I remember five years ago having a project and having 20% of my budget coming from uh, NGOs and CBC saying, well, sorry, we can't get involved because you're, you know, that's our policy, your journalism is compromised. So. It's, it's, I think it's a bit of a dilemma. It's, uh, it's often a, you know, you want independence, you, and you determine your independence outside of the UK again, which is a very, genuinely very well-funded system, by having a plethora of uh, donors, funders, broadcasters, so nobody can whip the line with you. Yeah. Um, 
So I think that's in some ways the trick, but at the same time, I don't think the... I would want to see a situation where certainly the, the BBC start compromising on the, what I thought for most instances is a, is a policy. Okay, thanks. So I'll take Jess, then Kerry, then Nick, then Kerry. Yeah, I just want to pick up that point um, gentleman made about, sorry, I forgot your name. David, um, about um, changing your mind halfway through. Um, it sounds like when you say you're making a film for an NGO, that sounds like indeed, I, I wrote down corporate video actually at the same moment that, um, that, it, that it was mentioned. Because obviously, you know, if, if an NGO commissions you to make a film, then that's, that's not you saying, you know, I'm going to the world to make my film, I'm looking for partners, you know, who wants to partner with me, you know, where's the mutual kind of meeting point, and do you agree with my, with my kind of standpoint? Obviously, you know, NGOs commission filmmakers all the time to make films for them, and quite rightly, you know, they've commissioned you to make a film, and I can understand that they then kind of want you to, to follow through. And my, and my other um, point was just actually, I don't think the BBC's like that anymore anyway. I mean, have you seen the new EdSpec forms that Channel 4 have got? You know, there's no changing, changing your mind halfway through anymore. Um, you know. <laughs> okay, thanks. For um, anyone. Kerry? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to, for those of you less familiar, it seems Nick as well, from the, of the NGO world, um, most NGO money, especially in the UK, comes from DFID, which is government money. Now, that isn't a contradiction by saying that uh, government is easier to get rid of than NGOs. What a lot of the government now does is literally farm out responsibility for a lot of what it's doing, which is why money goes through NGOs, and the rest of the money comes from the ODA, USID, African Development Bank, and so on. And, and, and they are not governmental, and they not only do not bite the hand that feeds them, they are literally, I think, con contributing to the undermining of politics and our integrity in that respect, and they are promoting the status quo. So the only thing I would say if you're a filmmaker, and I think you know you raised a really useful point over here, is don't think you're doing anything very radical just because you've partnered up with an NGO. And I'd say to Jess, you know, Brit Doc Foundation, you might as well bring out a manifesto because you know what you've said is very status quo with all the films that you've brought out. I haven't seen anything that is world changing. And and I think that's the tragedy. Okay, really? thanks. Okay, Nick. Well. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I, I think I just want to repeat now, very briefly. It, it is it, where the money come from comes from is important. We we've had loads of money over the years from the Open Society Fund of George Soros. What Soros has done with his NGO is practically calculable in furthering human rights and democracy all over the world. And this is my patch of NGOs. I I don't think the BBC should give way on its core. Um, positions of impartiality, and it, and it won't do that. I just hope somehow that more NGOs can be inspired to fund really individual critical journalism. And in this context, I, th I, I, w I hope you all go and see a Chinese film called Petition that took 12 years to make. The guy made it alone in Beijing. He got a bit of money from a French archive company at the end, and it's, it's stupendous. It's actually, as a piece of journalism, wonderful. And it's partly wonderful, we haven't touched on this, because it doesn't come from anywhere like the BBC or Justice Fund or anything. It just comes from the guy who made it. And these people are the hardest people to support and find and cherish. That's a really important argument. Okay, uh, Kevin, I, I, I am going to give them a five minute. We're going over five minutes in case someone's room. But yes, yeah. Kevin. I, I, I shouldn't give the wrong impression. I've worked with NGOs. I've, I've, uh, you know, eight NGO rations. I've flown in NGO planes. I've worked very closely with Action Aid in Malawi. I'm not saying that the NGOs are devil incarnate, but NGOs are like any other in human institution. They have pension funds, they have bureaucrats, they have fundraising. And particularly with big environmental powerful NGOs, like the Friends of the Earth, like the animal, International Fund for Animal Welfare, the RSPCA, <laughs> They, they are unexamined, they are politically unexamined, unexaminable institutions that are very powerful, that have budgets of hundreds of millions of pounds a year. And they are pushing forward their own sectarian agenda in a way that is not open to either democratic accountability or outside investigative critical scrutiny. So I'm not saying don't work with NGOs. I'm saying we have to, we have to bear in mind that they are human and just as corrupt and, as the rest of us. And okay. that's, the, that's the key point. Okay, thanks. That lady over there, please. I've got two people there. I've, I've only got time to take a few, but that, those two ladies there, this lady and that lady, and that'll be it. It's here, it's here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, God help me. I was supposed to keep my mouth shut. But my name is Andrea Holly, and I work for Human Rights Watch. Yeah. And I just want to raise a couple points because I think, for me, honestly, as you can tell from my voice, I'm American. We don't use the word campaigning, really. Um, so there was a moment where I thought we were going to define exactly what campaigning documentaries were. And I feel like we've got caught up in the funding discussion, maybe, which is the definition. Maybe someone can come back to me on that. But I just want to make a quick point to clarify a few things because we sit in a space that overlaps a lot of the principles Kevin's articulated about independent journalism, some questions that are being raised about film as both a piece of art and or a piece of journalism. Human Rights Watch does not fund any films, FYI. We have sat on the panels at Good Pitch as consultants for topical matter because we do have a variety of experts who often debate their own expertise. We have a very self-critical questioning staff. So these ideas of open debate go on internal to the organization. The only other point I want to raise is that we simply have a film festival. So films like Petition that Nick mentioned, filmmakers come to us, made by however they made it. And what we provide, I think, is a platform to amplify certain things. But I can assure you that when we present a film at our festival, there are two important things that go on. One, all the films we present are vetted internally by our various experts. And I've had many an unpleasant conversation with people who made what I guess would be called a campaigning documentary that did not survive the internal debate at our office. And that's not easy. So we actually, I guess, reject what some of these films would be. The other thing I would say is that when we do have discussions at our film festival, one of the things I think we're looking to do is instigate the kind of critical revelatory debate that's being articulated here because quite frankly there is still a lot to be revealed and a report from Human Rights Watch as in-depth and complex and probably depressing as it is is never going to be able to do what these films do but I would close with this what Nick said the films are never a complete statement and that's why we make a point of having discussions afterward that elucidate some of that so anyway blah blah that's my discourse oh, that's very that was very useful thank you um, so where were we? Yes, it's that lady behind. This lady here, and there's one over there, and that's it, I'm afraid. Hi, my name is Richa, and uh, I'm a journalist. I'm from India. Uh, my worry is that when, when, we, when you guys are talking about NGOs, you're talking about Amnesty, you're talking about Human Rights Watch, which are almost, almost institutions at one level, I would say. And maybe NGOs in this country are fairly accountable, and... But what actually happens in countries like India, where NGO, NGOs are propping up almost like corner shops. They are everywhere. There are a variety of them. Some, and a lot of them are getting money from places like Diffid, Wire, another big NGO, and it, then it comes down. Now, a lot of these people make films to send back eventually to their parent organization. I know people who are making films for them. And as an independent filmmaker, a lot of people like the gentleman there, for basic bread and butter, you do end up making films for them. And uh, a friend of mine was making it on renewable energy. Very good topic. We'd all like to make a film about renewable energy. Good idea about, about it in the mountains. He goes there. The, the, the thing <coughs> doesn't work. So a boy is sent up to make sure that you know, it's sort of going around. And, and this, you know, this is your bread and butter. But if, if you and Brit Dog start um, saying, if you use, use the term of NGOs, if, unless you qualify what sort of NGOs are, I don't know, is Welcome Trust the same thing as some little organization in India which is talking about AIDS in a village, which is getting money from a place in Delhi, which are educated Delhi people uh, talking about AIDS in that village. Is it the same thing? Because if you do that, and if, in, in countries like ours, we look up to the West in many ways, and we ape that eventually. If that becomes a rule of thumb for everybody to do that, you know, this is journalism, oh, this was funded by so-and-so NGO, and this is fine, it would be very, very worrying, actually. But you're talking uh, about... It, 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 I just need to... Confused. No, no, it's all right. No, let's, let's just gather these two <coughs> things. We'll have to go to the bar afterwards uh, to carry this on. Uh, this, this lady here, that lady at the back, and then final thoughts on the panel. Hi, my name's Salia Asan. I'm a filmmaker. 
I'm a doctor, I've got a military background, I've also got a background in journalism. I liked what Kevin said. I, um, I've learned the hard way. Um, I, I had rose-tinted glasses about the support that uh, NGOs might offer the sort of work I'm doing, but I had a rude awakening this year uh, through uh, an NGO that sort of turned me down flat. Basically, I've got the panel in front of me. I'm sort of sitting in the hot seat here, so I have to ask for all of your feedback. I've got a work in progress based on the issue of um, the increasing use of secret evidence in the UK. It's a project that I've been working on for the last two years. I've pitched it to everyone, including BritDoc. I'm not having much luck with it. I'm now being forced, <laughs> well, not forced, but I'm, I am exploring all, all avenues, including the NGO route. Um, I found, in my experience, that Liberty are great at speaking at events that I've organised to try and raise awareness. It sort of turned into a bit of a campaign. I didn't want it to. I wanted it to be a documentary that opens the debate and discussion, but I am finding that difficult to, to get to. Um, but when it comes to backing a film as such, or to be seen to be backing it in, in any way to do with the film, I've been told it's too controversial, which I found you know, I was a bit surprised about. So if, I just want to know your feedback. If I do, and I'm now in discussion with Amnesty, if I go down that route, am I damaging or am I sort of going down a route that will take away from opening uh, the floor for discussion and debate? I, I'm up for a discussion. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to make any judgments about it. I want people to tell me whether they think it's the right thing or not. To work with Amnesty? No, no, to work to, to, on the issue of secret evidence. So are you, are you sort of... Um, uh, See, taking I think that's a really yeah. good point. That's, well, the that kind, right? that's the kind of thing... No, that's no. the kind of... Would that be ever a good pitch? Something that is attacking... That some, basically investigating yeah. something that we, you know, is absolutely precious. Our democratic rights have been uh, undermined within the last four or five years. The question I'd like to ask, Jess, would that ever qualify for your definition of a good... Pitch. Okay, right, okay. Don't answer, you, you'll all get a chance. That, whoever that last lady was there. Hi, my name's Kate Fairfax. I'm independent. I'm also activist and um, work for government currently and worked for NGOs before, so I've kind of had an overview of all of it. And um, I take the point about your concern that possibly now the idea that all documentaries have to do some good. That is a concern. I, I mean, I also have been to, um, here, noticed... I just feel there's a whole lot of things that we're supposed to do other than make films. <coughs> For example, there's a guy with the vodka documentary and it's incredibly entrepreneurial what he's doing and he's invented a brand of vodka as a result of his documentary, which I drank last night with, with great appreciation. But that's not, you know, the kind of entrepreneurial thing that I would be doing two years after making a film and, and a lot of people don't want to be then you know, forced to do two years of campaigning after a film either. But for those of us who do, and I'm one who does, to me it's the perfect marriage. I'm incredibly excited that there's a genre of documentary now where we can actually say this is what it is. As long as we're honest with the audience and we are investigating issues as in a balanced way as we can, what's the problem with that? But in terms of balance, I feel you're... Um, Sorry, I, was, I missed your name because I wasn't here at the beginning, but there's conflation going on between different causes. For example, anti-whaling, climate change, and aid in Africa and other things. I, sort of, I just wonder whether... Haven't documentaries done the hard work already in um, investigating some of these issues? So if I was now to go and do a documentary on anti-whaling, I probably wouldn't start representing the views of whalers because it's been done, and as a society, haven't we reached a point where... Aren't we just rehashing old voices have already had a lot of space? Isn't the idea to make something fresh? So if I'm looking at climate change, am I really going to revisit all the old arguments that it's not happening if we've, if we've kind of globally reached a... You know, no, we've advanced our position? I precisely say to you, yeah. yes. I Kevin, you'll yes. get your chance. Yes, OK, right. Well, I, okay. I, I disagree. I think no, we've, we've advanced and evolved. I, I think that we, we obviously um, haven't uh, come to any agreement here. In the order in which the, uh, they spoke, they'll come back. Um, for what it's worth, I've just wanted to say this thing on whaling because I think the cove kind of lurks a bit behind this conversation. Um, but I have mates in Australia who were telling me the story about how, uh, the, I don't know how to pronounce this, but the, the, the city Brume has cut off all links with the city of Taje. Uh, so Taje is the, 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 the focus of the, uh, uh, the, the cove. Uh, that's where the Japanese whalers are. And it's been uh, dubbed the Auschwitz for dolphins. And so people in Western Australia have now said they won't have anything to do with these Japanese uh, people because of their brutality. And they've all seen the whale and uh, they've all seen the cove and all the rest of it. And the point that my mate made 
was that this did feel like a rehashing of Australian imperialist attitudes to the Japanese taking a right on form. And so sometimes films that think they're doing good, we might at least be a little bit critical of. It's not that you have to necessarily make a pro whaling film, but that sometimes simplistic messaging and advocacy that says it's serious investigative documentary, um, those are the things I don't think we should muddle up. You can be an ad, no, I'm just saying, but I'm just saying that's the kind of thing I think I'd at least like people to think about after this. Is there a danger we pat ourselves on the back for making good documentaries, whoever funds them, whereas actually what we're really interested in is feeling good about ourselves and talking to an audience who kind of claps us for saying exactly what they always thought in the first place. So I'd at least like that to be something to take away with. Okay, Jess, your final thoughts. Oh, final thoughts. Well, I thought yeah. I was going to be responding to... Oh, no, whatever you want. What, say whatever okay, you well, want. This uh, is the final bit. Well, sorry, I just wanted to pick up... I, I was a bit confused by this. I wasn't sure what Kevin's point was. What was it about that you thought we wouldn't well, take a Brit doc? Because we're open to all ideas. And I, I haven't... I don't, I don't read... I'm not the person who reads the submissions right, when they no. first come in. I haven't seen your idea. I can't respond to it, having heard one minute no. about it, whether we'd take it or wouldn't no. take it. What, what I meant I by it, Jess, was what, there are certain uh, ideas that are obviously sort of complex, controversial. Someone who said, oh, I want to investigate the use of secret evidence in, in the courts and the land last, you know, eight years, it doesn't naturally lend itself to a sort of wide consumerist campaign. But if obviously the police are coming through your door, it's a pretty vital part of that, sure, that sure. democratic yeah. investigation. A very, small, a very small number of the films that we make, um, you know, have NGO involvement and are campaigning films. But okay, but anyway, but anyway, broadly speaking, Jess, your final thoughts. You don't have to answer a particular pitch, but you get the gist. Um, my final thoughts um, were... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very gratified that, that Nick and I um, agree so much. I never thought we'd agree um, so much about anything. So this why, was really bodes for... Bodes for um, why are you so much? Because you, you, you normally hate my films, but... Um, <laughs> you never actually I feel like this can, We can release um, this film of this thing as the love story. And whilst, and whilst, <laughs> and whilst I appreciate you know, the points being... And why not? Being, being, ...being made by <laughs> Kerry and Kevin about... Shh. I don't know, the NGOs are organisations like any other and are as flawed as any. I mean, I don't feel like I've learned anything new from that. And that's why I'm saying it's really about um, us in the sector sharing best practice we need to share and learn together. I worked with this NGO, they were dreadful, they were really difficult. I worked with these guys, they were great. And you know what? We worked up a really great prenup agreement, which I want to share with everyone because it was very, very useful. We found that actually later <coughs> we had problems because this bit hadn't discussed up front, so I would advise others to do that, etc., etc., etc. We need to learn together best practice, our sector and the NGO sector, which is why we keep bringing them together. And we'll find ways to work together to mutual advantage on certain kinds of films. Um, and, and we won't work together on other kinds of films. And that's, and that's how it should be. OK, thank you. Um, actually, I'll come to Kevin next. Cause well, I, I, I mean, I actually do agree with some things that Jess says. It's, it's, that the, it's good that there are many different kinds of films. It's good that there are obviously campaigning, campaigning documentaries. My, my problem with it is the kinds of films that lend themselves for funding for, you know, quotes campaigning documentaries are sort of basically, you know, aimed at a kind of wide consumerist audience. They deal with uh, what we all regard as intrinsic good. They essentially don't really look at very difficult, controversial subjects. Like, for instance, this person in, in, in the front row, secret, you know, liberties, the attack on liberties. That's, you know, that is a campaigning documentary, exposing the wrongs of a democratic government against its own citizens that's taken place under our noses in the last like, you know, five or six years. That, of course, is that's, that, that's a far greater, maybe old-fashioned, definition of a campaigning documentary. Making documentaries that repeat this message about climate change and the environment, etc., they are merely pandering to widespread opinions and attitudes that are held by the majority of the population. They're not critical. They are confirming prejudices rather than challenging them. Okay, thanks. Um, Nick? I recognise this portrait of our films at all. No, no, all right. So. We know that we don't agree. That's we d Yes, well, Nick? Well, actually, I've much enjoyed this debate. I think you should be critical about everything. You should view everything. And much of the happiest uh, hours of my journalistic life have been spent watching shit propaganda because it does things for you. You watch it, you go out, you feel better because you've understood the shit it is. Uh, the writer Gustave Flaubert, author of the miraculous Madame Bovary that is as far from being a campaigning novel as you could be, said, you, you should drink the Atlantic Ocean to piss in a pint pot. 
And that's what I would say to you about contemporary media, and that's sort of what I feel about this whole topic. We've drank the ocean, now let's go and piss in a pint pot. Uh, thank you. Kerry? Um, it's a shame Jess doesn't recognise how status quo the films she's funded are. Even, even the petition, Nick, by the way, is... Uh, which, are can can we, which of my films are you talking on. about? Right. When you say well, that. I could get the list out. Yeah, well, get it, the no, list no, out. No, 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 get no, the no. fucking list look, out. Look, you two don't agree. Look, it's the end of the no, session. She's characterising yes. our body of work as a bunch of noddy films, no, you know, no, and I yes. find that really no, irritating. Listen, listen, name, listen, them, listen. name them and say me right, why right, they're right, noddy. Right, right, right. Right, listen. Listen, you know that one of... Do you know one of the things that's interesting about having a debate is that what happens is that people who disagree with you insult you. And oh, people find no it time. offensive. Sometimes no, the chairman insults. assaults you. No, no. <laughs> and do you know, do you know, is, how, do you know what? Innovation. Nick, 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 Nick. I run the Institute of Ideas and they invited me to do this debate because they I'm said... I'm not criticising you, no, I'm just stating Nick, a fact. Can I just explain something? Can I just explain something to you? What is most objectionable is when people can't give each other shit in a grown-up audience without everybody panicking, right? I understand she is going to insult you. You probably said things that didn't go down with her well. I just would rather we didn't all sulk. That's all I'm saying. Let her insult you, then hit her afterwards. But let's finish the debate. Right. You carry on being insulting, and you be affronted, and we'll sort it out affronted. over a pint. Not you! Me, me, Bloody I'm, hell! I'm, I'm affronted. Known. I am affronted. Right. Kerry, carry on affronting the panel. Well, I, I, Jess, I'm really sorry if you're feeling insulted. I don't... I okay, can't carry on making being insulted, which is much Please, worse. Please, get a life. God, you know, I've had hate mail all week because I used the word disgusting about somebody's work. We should be able to argue and disagree, you know. I, I, I often fancy people that I have nothing in common with and completely disagree with. But the point is we should be able to, as Claire says, in a grown-up way, say, I think some of your Slater films are fantastic, their content is not radical, in my view, or world-changing in any way. That's my point. And all I'm saying is if we want to make campaigning films, and I hope many more people will and do, be passionate about something, absolutely investigate it, make sure that you are questioning what's going on, and don't kid yourself because it's incredibly popular and, you know, very moralistic and doing good, that you're changing anything. That's the tragedy, and that's anti-politics in my view. Let's take the hard view. If we really want to change society, we have to dig. And there's nothing wrong with taking sides, there's nothing wrong with expressing an opinion, but that doesn't prevent you wanting to be objective. Because if you don't get to the truth, you're not going to change anything, let's face it. Can we thank our panel, please?